any field, and particularly in the fields of technology or software development, which I'm most familiar with, is really about changing the world. It's about building a world that's different from the one we're in. Maybe in a very small way, maybe in a grand way. It might be about that product that you want everyone to use, or it might be about the environment that you want to be different, or about medicine that you want to operate in a different way. And to do that, we have to imagine a world that is different to the one we're in. We have to let uh, our imaginations go to what things could possibly be like. And the way we do that generally is we look at the world we're in and we think about what the perturbations are that we can make to that world to get to another one. We generally think about what the behaviors are that we have, what the technologies are that we have, and how they constrain us, and then we think about how we modify that to get to the next world. And that's generally wrong. It's generally wrong because if we repeat that process over and over again, we don't really know where it gets us. It gets us somewhere, but we have no idea where that somewhere is. This point is, is very well illustrated by a story that uh, was well documented by Eric Morris and also in Superfreakonomics. In the late 1800s, at the turn of the last century, New York and London were literally drowning in horse manure. It was a huge problem. Milli well, thousands of horses being used for transport, both on horseback as well as to draw carriages all over the cities, and no one knew what to do with horse manure, literally needy. And there were lots of innovation in sanitation and sweeping horse manure off the streets. Uh, at each intersection in New York, there were special sweepers so that before you crossed the street, they would sweep it away. There were innovations about how to catch the manure and cart it away. And of course, none of those, no matter how we optimized the sanitation methods, had anything to do with the actual solution. The actual solution is to get rid of horses and to invent the internal combustion engine and build cars. So really what we need when we're innovating is we have to think about what is the future like unconstrained about what the today's world is like. We really should not be concerned at all about what it's like to live in this world. We should be imagining what the world is that we want to inhabit. Again, it might be in a very simple way. It might be your own product or it might be uh, something much grander, but we have to think about where we're going. So why don't we do this? Why is it so hard to achieve? We value it. We call it all kinds of names. We call it stretch goals in business, or we call it thinking laterally. Why don't we do it? Well, I think there are a number of reasons, but I'll illustrate two. The one is we're really concerned and fearful of the execution path. We think that if we take these leaps too far, they're just unachievable. But the truth is that we execute on these imaginative things with monotonous regularity. If I told you just a few years ago that we'd be putting all of the encyclopedia companies in the world out of business because we'd get everyone on the planet to give up freely of their knowledge, collaborate it into a database, and then make that available to everyone for free, you'd think I was crazy. But Wikipedia is the fifth most used website in the world. If just a few years ago I told you that the same device with which you got that free website can also tell you exactly where you are on the planet, anywhere in the world, without having to use maps and could navigate you to anywhere else. You'd have told me I was completely nuts, but it's every day. So these leaps of execution we do with monotonous regularity, and they really are not the, the, the stumbling block for us. The other stumbling block that we think is there is common wisdom. We try and think what other people tell us, and we try and listen to conventional wisdom, what other smart people before us have thought about these topics. But in fact, that is as constraining. These new ideas, these ones that take us a leap forward, are not based on conventional wisdom. 
optimization of sanitation and the conventional wisdom of sanitation did not invent the internal combustion engine, but it solved and changed the world in a fundamental way. So we really need to think about our own imaginations about the world we're going to. So if you're here at TED today to try and get your next inspiration for the great big new idea, if you're here to think, uh, to find out how you can think laterally for that new inspiration, or to use that horrible phrase, if you're here to learn to think outside the box, then I invite you to just please go home. Um, when you're trying to think outside the box, Ted probably is your box. So once we've imagined this world, we've got to get there. And that's where execution and process comes in. So how do we do that? Well, from the world we're in to the world we want to be in, there are any number of paths we can choose, any number of initial steps we can take. And the, the initial step we take really is dependent on, in this case now, the world we're in, but also where we're going. And in the startup world, we do that by a process known as mo the minimum viable product. What's the least set of functionality that I can deliver that will take me on this journey? And that, least, that minimum viable product might be to reach a specific audience, it might be to bring that audience along with you and to prove that you're on the right track to get to the eventual world. It should not be confused, in my mind, with proof of concept. If I think back to the mistakes I made in the past is to think about minimum viable product as something about engineering efficacy, that I want to do the minimum amount of engineering to get a product out. I don't think it's about that. It's about what is the core, the kernel idea that I can deliver that brings the audience along with me? And of course, if I'm successful in doing that, then I've created a new world. Maybe, again, in a very small way, maybe in a grand way, and the world is fundamentally different. But now, what often happens is people think, well, I've created this minimum viable product, let's slap on feature after feature after feature, and, and you know, it'll just be great. Well, no, you're in a new world now. You've created the minimum viable product. And the next step is another minimum viable product. And you iteratively go forward to the world you want to be in. The next one might be not to reach a specific audience, but it might be to invent a new technology. Or it might be to find the funding, uh, create enough of a, a hype to get the funding for the next project. And so you iterate. And you ask me, so, How's this different from the first slide where I was iterating? And the, the key difference is I'm now doing this knowing where I'm going. I know where the destination is, and I'm not constrained only by where I'm coming from. The other key element when you're innovating and creating minimum viable product like this is now it is all about collaboration. It is all about finding out what did the others do before me? Which are the technologies that I can employ in doing this? What are the learnings that other people have had? What can I beg? What can I borrow? How can I change what I'm doing to get a better solution to the next step that I'm going to? So the minimum viable product cycle is all about very careful collaboration with the best in the field. So I leave you with uh, an example. About a decade, just under a decade ago, Amazon had the idea that you could, how about if you built very large data centers, and call them cloud, and you rent those data centers out to people, but in a way where they bring their applications and they could run them in these data centers as if you were serving electricity. When you need the compute power, you switch it on, you use it. When you don't need it anymore, you switch it off and you don't need use it anymore. And this was revolutionary at the time. At the time, if you wanted compute power as a startup or as a company, you had to go out and buy servers, build a data center, do it all yourself. This was just, you can come and use this or you don't need to use it. The other companies that were doing this were locking you into year-long or month-long or three-month-long contracts where you could come rent their 
their compute power in their hosting services and, and do it at some cost over time. So what was the minimum viable product? If this was a, a vision that, that Amazon was going to execute on, it would take, and in fact now has taken, billions of dollars to do. Large million server data centers had to be built. What was the minimum viable product? Well, the minimum viable product there was give someone access to compute power on a couple of cents per hour, a few cents per hour, on an hourly basis with no contract. Bring your credit card, use it, don't need it anymore, stop using it, no contract, switch it off. That's not to minimize the engineering required underneath to make this work. Lots of security, lots of networking, lots of very hard engineering. But the minimum viable product was actually quite simple. It was simply, you could come consume this and you can stop when you no longer want it. And that set off on the journey, which is now one of the largest cloud computing providers in the world. So really, it's about that long vision and the stepwise refinement. It's about individual inspiration to get to that long vision and then intense collaboration and iterative execution. Thank you.